Once everyone was aboard the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, Mira seemed to relax a little. Davis and Thompson were chatting away with Vebby and Fennis. Poven still stayed near Mira when the officers were chatting with each other. She felt a little lost now that her services as translator was no longer needed. The winds were much stronger here, and one of Poven's wings got caught in the wind, causing him to lift up. He reflexively opened his other wing. Poven, remember, glide, do not flap. Mira yelled at him. What was that, chief? Thompson asked. I'm sorry, sir. Ensign Poven's wing got caught on a draft. They come from a lower gravity world, so if he tries to fly, our gravity will break most of his wing bones and tear through his wing skin. The atmospheric belts they wear can maintain their own atmospheric conditions, but it can't keep up if they full-on fly. After riding the currents and getting used to how it felt under his wings, Poven was eventually able to land. He quickly wrapped his wings about himself tightly to avoid doing that again. The rest of the remaining Drala quickly tightened their own wings about their bodies. I see. Let's get everyone inside. Admiral Davis replied. Chief Rod Regas, your Captain Martinelli sent over your uniforms. He called over a sailor who had a duffel bag which was handed over to Mira. Mira looked a little closer at one of the destroyer escorts. Sir, is that the USS Bainbridge I see? Yes, it is. Do you think your captain would allow us to come get you and not be a part of the escort? Once we stopped receiving responses, he has called in almost daily to NASA to get answers. Honestly, I was willing to bet that if we denied his request to join the escort, he would have gone rogue to be here. I'm not so sure about that. Captain Martinelli wouldn't break protocols like that. He might have been hailing like crazy until someone gave him answers, but never would he go rogue. Mira replied. As she finished saying that, a sailor came up the Admiral. Sir, Captain Martinelli of the USS Bainbridge is on the horn for you. You were saying, Chief. Davis chuckled. Maybe you should go take that call. We'll be in the ready room. Come see us there after you have spoken with your captain and made yourself Navy presentable. Yes, sir. She saluted, received the return salute, and headed to the comms room. In the comms room, she was directed to the receiver. This is Chief Mira Rodriguez speaking. Chief, it's good to hear your voice again. Do you have any idea how many calls I received from my nephew? I don't know how he was able to get people to patch him through so frequently while on duty himself, but he's very resourceful. I have to admit that. Did those aliens treat you well? And who took down communications like that? Yes, sir. I was treated extremely well. I haven't had a chance to be debriefed yet, so I don't know how much I'm allowed to say over comms. I understand. You should be able to say at least if the comms were interrupted by the aliens. Not by the aliens I was with, sir. I understand. Go do what you have to do, Chief. I hope to see you back on the Bainbridge soon. I hope so too, sir, she replied. The call ended, and a sailor took her to where she could change her clothes as well as where the ready room was located. Once she was in her khaki-colored shipboard working uniform, she headed to the ready room and then waited to be told she could sit. The Flexusri each had their specialty chairs, and the Drala were able to manage the human chairs. Is Captain Martinelli well? Admiral Davis asked. I believe he is calmer now, sir. However... I suspect he will grill me himself once I am returned to his ship. That sounds about right, Chief. I wouldn't expect any less of him. Grill? Are you in danger, Chief Mira? Vebby asked worriedly. Grill is slang for question soundly, Rear Admiral. I promise that I will be completely safe with my captain. Mira looked around and noticed Commander Morris wasn't in the room. Excuse me, sirs. What happened to Commander Morris? I thought he had survived the assault. I'm sure he's somewhere on board the ship. When we left to this room, he had been distracted. You know how these ships can be hard to navigate for non-Navy enlistees. Davis replied. General Thompson added, If I had not spent my earlier enlisted time on board Navy vessels, I likely would have also been confused. I always did enjoy the Marine taxi service. He joked. 
the admiral gave him a poke with his elbow good-naturedly. It was a sign that they had been friends as well as co-workers for a long time. Admiral Davis explained to the aliens, The general and I belong to different branches of service. Each branch has a love-hate relationship with all of the other branches. We all have our strengths, and our weaknesses are proudly backed up by the strengths of the other branches. It's like having siblings. I can tease and make fun of my siblings, but if anyone else does, I will fight them to submission and make them apologize to my sibling. Ah, I understand, Vebby replied. I feel the same way about my spawn mates. Fennis cut in. I understand the diplomat you had intended for us was lost in the conflict. We would prefer if Chief Mira were to be this for us. She has lived with us, and we have forged mutual respect for each other. I believe that can be arranged. Davis replied after a few moments of thought. Bureaucracy takes time, and the rest of the Chief's enlistment will have to be accounted for, but I believe this can be arranged. He chuckled. Captain Martinelli will be both happy for you and pissed we're taking away his highest-ranking machinist mate aboard the Bainbridge. They began talking and getting to know each other, and finally, Vaby asked, I understand you will need to speak with others to make a real decision, but do you think your people will join the Federation? General Thompson beat Admiral Davis to it as he said, They touched our boats. No one touches the U.S. Navy's boats and gets away with it. Davis gave Thompson a small elbow to the ribs for stealing the Navy's line. Eventually, Commander Morris found the ready room, and General Thompson gestured for him to take a seat. Now that we're all here, Chief, how about you give us a full debriefing? Start from leaving Earth. Yes, sir. The mission started off great. Roger was able to correct course as needed, but the autopilot we were using was very accurate. We were all asleep when it happened. I'm a light sleeper, and the pings against the hull woke me up. Looking back, there must have been a harder hit that woke me up first, but at the time, all I heard was the lighter pings. I got up to take a look around, and then the alarms went off that we all knew meant to get into our spacesuits. Once I was in my suit, I realized no one else was in the room with me. I grabbed a suit with the intent to help someone into it, and then we could go back and help others. They were all dead. The atmosphere in the ship was completely gone and we were no longer noticeably moving. I was staring at either it's a short and rough death once my air ran out, or if I could fix the life support. I could be looking at a long, agonizing death from hunger. I never turned away from a challenge, so I was determined to fix the ship. I fixed the life support and power at the same time. Now I was only going to face a long, agonizing death. It was then that I jettisoned the dead. Hindsight being 2020, I realize it was the wrong choice. I know that Commander Morris felt I should be able to make a refrigeration room, but if you look at the ship and the schematics, and assuming that I knew I was going to survive and make it back home, that ship did not have rooms that were airtight. They are close, but do not seal all the way. Secondly, I didn't have the materials to make it so that the air didn't circulate out of any room I put them in. At that time, I fully expected that I was going to die out there. It would take time for any message to get to Earth, time to fabricate a new ship and crew it, and time to get out to me. Time that I didn't feel I had. Davis interrupted. The seals weren't airtight. The exterior ones were, but any of the interior doors were not. They used a different kind of seal material, and in some cases we could see light through a closed door. Even the door that was supposed to be the airlock for if we had to open the exterior door for anything. That one was the best seal, but there were still leaks. Continue, Davis said. I was out fixing the thruster when the crew of Black Hole found me. You haven't met them, and I don't think they can even come down here. The Federation uses color outlines on their emblem to denote classes of ability to survive on worlds, I guess would be the best way to put it. Black Hole is a green class. They have the fewest worlds they can touch down on and survive. It's based on allergy. If they were to even touch the plants here, they would get hives. The Meteor's crew is a black class. They can go to nearly every inhabited world. They might have to be careful of gravity, 
or if the air quality or temperatures are too extreme for the atmospheric belts to handle. Our world is classified as a black class planet. She then relayed the rest of her journey. Do you think we can speak with these other heads of ships? Thompson asked the aliens. Of course, Fennis replied. To Vibi, he said, If you hail Commander Schwanrawis, I'll hail Captain S's Veta. After getting their targets on a video call, they both headed over and got their counterparts in view, too. We still have two hours until our nocturnal counterparts awaken. We'll have about an hour of overlap, and then we will need to rest ourselves, Sisveta said. The leaders all spoke with each other, leaving Morris very confused as he did not receive a translator implant. Thompson told Mira she could act as his translator, so she did. Hey everyone, hope you loved the video. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe for more awesome sci-fi content. You can also support us by hitting the thanks button at the bottom of the video. Your generosity goes a long way. Every bit helps us bring you more stories from the stars. Thanks a bunch.